coming in. So this is the uh, this is the Medicine Prize, which is often the most boring of the three science <laughs> ones, at least from the point of view of science, uh, the least creative. That's not true this time around. And uh, and then and I hope to show you that. And then uh, and then David back on stage with a uh, with the Peace Prize next week, right? Yes. Yeah, and. Um, and Mel May Elkins is talking, doing the literature prize, so that's the book end, the end of a series, maybe the hardest one to actually do. So, um, so that's what's ahead. I hesitate to even mention mental health because of the day after the last one. I think people fatigue will set in. Um, I did want to take uh, just a few minutes out just to talk a little bit about why we're doing this series. I mean, yes, it's about the Nobel Prizes and the, 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 the who and the what, of it, but it's really much broader than that. It, it's about uh, uh, science in general. It's, uh, it's how they go about doing what they've done, particularly at the, high, at the highest level. And, um, and that's what we're being treated to, in a way, with this Nobel series. Uh, and, but there are broader uh, societal implications, and um, and there are, I was just asked about the sources, where the sources come from for a lot of this. That's very germane uh, because quality of the sources for a program like this is everything. And um, so, um, and and they're using backstories to this, and David brought some of those out last week with the economics prize. Um, so, let's, let's, uh, I'm starting out because it's coming up in the Advent season, and I thought I ran, in, ran across these two because on the, on the left, where's my, here, here we are, on the, on your left, right in here, these are all young stars, uh, over a thousand of them, well, the picture's actually much larger than that, but they're well over a thousand, so this is birthing. Uh, a good way to think about the cosmos is to think about it as creative destruction, uh, creation, destruction, recreation. And the cycle goes on. It happens in our lives. We're born, we live out our lives, we die. Biologically, we go through this cycle. But it happens at the cosmic level as well. And that's what's illustrated really on the right hand slide because that's a supernova, or just after a supernova. The supernova are really the implosions, explosions of uh, uh, middle to large stars. It's questionable whether our sun is big enough to actually do this. But in self-destructing like that, elements are created. I mean, only we, in the earliest universe, we only had three elements, right? Hydrogen, helium, and lithium. So all the others had to be created by supernova or even bigger events. And, uh, and so they're color coded. I don't know whether you can see that by, for certain elements. But the point is that all of this stuff, stardust, is scattered all around the neighborhood and then picked up in the interstellar space and the kind of dust that's there. And then gravitation works its magic and they're turned into swirling masses of gas and particles, and then uh, galaxies and stars are reborn, or maybe not reborn, yes, reborn. Estimates suggest, for example, that in our corner of the Milky Way, there have been three such transitions. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a great way to think about things because it expands the canvas enormously, doesn't it, to, to think about this. So, um, the next one, and, uh, okay, now periodic table here. I'm not gonna go through this tedious thing, except that it is the 150th anniversary of two important things, the periodic table and the journal Nature. And a lot of the best stuff in science has been published in Nature, of which there'll be a couple of examples here. And, um, but, uh, if you look at this periodic table, uh, you can pick out the elements of life, right? So, hydrogen, 
here, sodium, uh, magnesium here, um, potassium, calcium, and so on. But notice where they all are, and the top and the top two layer, top two or three, right? It's carbon, the key one, the one I've called the matriarchal uh, element because of its unique ability to form strong but not too strong bonds. And uh, it's, it's really the remarkable one, and nitrogen and oxygen, of course, and chloride, and uh, you know, when you have your blood taken and they measure your electrolytes, guess what they're measuring? These, these three and uh, the negative and the charged one. So, you know, there aren't a lot of these. I think there are 13 elements in our body. There are 118. None of them in the middle uh, or high level or the very, very heavy level. And, uh, and some of them are darn right toxic. Cobalt, we talked about that with the lithium battery. Right, nickel. Uh, they can even be neighbors of the of the good ones. So, um, so that's it's an interesting tale, and um, so we'll just go on to the next one because it is the 150th anniversary of nature, and they did an interesting thing. They took up a whole issue, and um, it's kind of hard to pick out the ten top ones in, uh, in 150 years, especially when it's published every week. The fact that it was published every week was a huge uh, step forward because um, science tended uh, to move forth at a snail's pace. I mean, stuff had to be you know, published in the proceedings of the Royal Society. They weren't published very often. The same thing in the United States and in other countries, the equivalents. So it was hard to get stuff published and there were kind of long delays. They offered quick publication for good stuff. Brevity. Watson and Crick is one page, 110% uh, of a page. But then if you look at the rest of the articles in journal, in, in nature, it's rare to see one, 10 pages. Most of them are two, three, four pages, even the best. Uh, so they're very, very tight about the writing and what they allow. And uh, so, no surprise, at the top of the list they chose is the Watson and Crick paper, The Structure of DNA. Um, and uh, and uh, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of them here, not, not, not all of them, but, uh, but it's an interesting thing. Uh, well, there's the original paper, DNA. Here's the more modern cartoon version of DNA, actually showing the kind of, well, uh, this is not the modern, if, if, if this were truly up to date, it would all be three dimensional. And, and it's interesting now that nature and science and journals like that now, because of, of computer modeling, it's hard to read any article on physics or chemistry without seeing the three dimensional pattern. And in fact, that's what makes them active, right? You can have active sites in, in, a, in a gene, and that really depends on the conformational shape of the gene and whether active sites are covered up or exposed, right? How do you know that unless you actually see the shape of, 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 the, of the gene? So, there we are. And, uh, oh, we did that, the back. Okay, now, well, also, Big change, Raymond Dirk in South Africa, 2000 and, uh, not 2019, 15, uh, with Australopithecus Afri africanus. So, what was so big about this? This is the first transitional fossil. Transitional between apes and humans. It had brain size around 350 cc's. It had the kind of the, the skull features uh, the skeletal features that were kind of uh, mostly ape, but clearly on its way somewhere. And, uh, and around, uh, by current estimates, uh, about uh, 3.6 uh, or 7 million years uh, old. Interestingly enough, he was trained in England uh, and trained very well. 
and went back home and uh, uh, made this discovery. And because of Tilt Down Man and the, the controversy surrounding Tilt Down Man and whether it was real or not or made up, uh, even his mentors were very skeptical of his finding. He wrote a book that was never published because no one would publish it. He sent it into the Royal Society that said, no, we're not touching that. So it remains unpublished. We have one copy. Uh, well, this is this year. Yet another. Uh, with a brain size of maybe, uh, well, maybe a little over 400 cc's. But you can see the very heavy orbits here, the, uh, the, the protruding um, upper, upper jaw, lower jaw here, flat nose. And wherever you see this kind of dip like this, it means there's horrendous muscle, there's horrendous muscle development to close the jaw. Uh, so they're probably chewing or eating tubers, something that's hard to chew, and uh, but but small brain, and uh, so it's a continuing story, as probably most of you know. You know, it's certainly something I've been looking at um, uh, as an interest. And then we just talked about the first exoplanet found around a star-like star. That was one of the ten. Um, uh, Mayor was quite lucky, right? He's in his 40s. He did the work when he was in his, and, uh, much earlier, right? So he's, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the work had been talked about a lot. And so there was some expectation that at some point he might get a Nobel. Well, he did. Uh, he and his mentor. This one is cell identity reprogrammed. This is extraordinary. I, I can see why nature chose this one. Because what's all this about? It's reprogramming cells. I mean, you could take an adult cell, say a fibroblast in, in the skin, and it, by manipulating four genes, only four genes, you can, you can turn that cell into a stem cell and then re-engineer it to become a nerve cell or a muscle cell or almost any other cell. I mean, it's stunning. Talk about creation, a creation story in biology, that's one of them. And it's a very powerful one. Um, and this fellow's a prof at, uh, at Cambridge, and he did a lot of the, of the uh, original work, say, back in the 1970s. And uh, then his uh, graduate students carried it on, which showed you how important laying on of hands is uh, in, in science and, uh, and in other endeavors. And I think probably the two will end up with a prize. This is an interesting inclusion because they're obviously thinking about climate change and the ozone layer, right? right? And um, the monoclonal antibodies because all modern treatment of uh, of autoimmune diseases and cancer is pretty much a story of monoclonal antibodies, being cells that make one specific species of antibody. Okay, you may have a thousand cells sitting in a ditch, but only a few of them will take make antibody A, subprime B or whatever, I'm making it up, but very specific. And there are some early cancers detected that way, especially in males, right? at my age, and you have your annual checkup, and they check your blood, and uh, they see your serum protein is up a little bit. And the Mayo Clinic that was early on in this, and if you check them, it tends to be a cluster of cells somewhere in the bone marrow cranking out Chevrolet's, one version <laughs> of an antibody, but a whole lot of them. And, uh, and, and it, it can remain steady like that for years and then turn on a dime into multiple myeloma, a much more aggressive cancer uh, once it, the mutations have, have accumulated. So these are good choices. Um, and actually, uh, that, and of course, there's the, the, just to give you some, I didn't show this, this one when we talked about this before, but this is, the discovery of the first exoplanet. But just to put uh, a face on it here, I mean, here's the, the sun, well, the sun here, 
and on a kind of a relative distance, um, there's Jupiter out there. In fact, I've got it cut off here. But look at this one. They're so close together, it's hard to separate them. And this is a huge, uh, not only is the sun there, the sun much larger, or, or larger anyway, but this is a very large planet, and it's mostly gas. And you wonder how it hangs onto its gas if that thing is sitting so close. Um, I don't see a lot of interest in that, except that they found the first exoplanet. Um, so let's move along. Oh, now, recording electrical activity from single and multiple cell. Boy, has this ever changed. I got into this in the late 60s in Toronto, uh, and, uh, and it continued on into Oxford the first uh, two or three years, uh, sticking in a glass micropipette and uh, less than a micron in size at the tip, and impaling it into a single cell and recording from it, and we thought we were very elegant, and there were several Nobel Prizes granted in that period using that kind of technology. So I thought it was really hot. But, um, but as everything in science, it moved along. That's crude now. Hardly anyone's doing that now. Uh, the next big advance was this patch clamp thing. You don't punch a hole through the, through the cell. You suck up the, a little bit of the cell membrane into the pipette, and it might only include one um, ion channel. Then you can define the characteristics of a very specific ion channel. Otherwise, you're listening to all of the channels when you stick an electrode inside the cell. So that was a big step forward. <coughs> and then the ability to record from, in my days, you had just a cell body to stand any chance of recording anything. But these days, the technology, we record from almost any part of it. And, and even more importantly, in the last, um, say, 15 years, if you take those ion channels with a uh, compound, a protein that fluoresces, then every time that cell fires, there's a blip of light. And furthermore, you can also make them responsive to light. You can stimulate them with light. So they're already doing this in humans, using a form of li pulse light delivered deep in the brain to stimulate cells that have been sensitized to light as a way of very discreetly and with much better control stimulating parts of the brain. I mean, that has enormous uh, implications for the management of things like depression. So, it's, uh, so that field has just moved along and uh, the technology and, uh, and I've said many or several times before all of this is built on the shoulders of people who preceded them, and, uh, and uh, it's certainly true here. So, um, and the generosity of people, because when I mentioned this, I mean, I spent a very frustrating year in Toronto trying to teach myself how to do an intracellular recording. It was the dumbest thing in the world to do it that way, because when I went to Oxford, six days later, I was in a lab where they were doing this all of the time, I thought, oh, geez, you know, why did I spend all that time wasting that time learning this? I should have got on an airplane. And in fact, Jack Eccles, who later got the Nobel Prize, was in Buffalo. And we actually became, in a way, friends. And he saved my, my uh, butt uh, more than a few times over interpretations of, of data. So he was, you know, they were, people are generous you know, by and large. In the, in the science world, at least that's the way I come. So let's just move along. And uh, so here we are, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, and then uh, on down there. Here are the recent ones. Uh, last year, uh, this was a. I think this is, was fairly prosaic, uh, and I'll say why later. Although effective. It, it, it showed that uh, you could create uh, uh, antibodies that uh, could target the, uh, the place where, where cancer cells and T cells kind of join. It, by, by, uh, cancer cells and, and T cells, they're a form of lymphocyte, right? And uh, 
they, they kind of buddy up to one another and uh, shake hands through complementary receptors. And if the key fits the lock, the cancer cell gets a bye and the T cell keeps going. But if you create an antibody to disrupt that key in the lock, now the T cell says that cancer cell is foreign and marks it for destruction. That's what they got the Nobel Prize for. That's, that family of drugs is what uh, Jimmy Carter was given. And when he had metastatic uh, melanoma, a sure death sentence. And, uh, and it was anything but, he's still ticking. Um, in fact, he's talking about uh, uh, or being introduced to his maker soon, and he's happy about it, at least uh, he's happy to go. A remarkable man. I think. Um, some of the other, and you can see the variety of, of, of some of the studies. Just because of my background, I would rather like this, this uh, uh, wife and husband team here. And John O'Keefe was the mentor of, uh, of her husband here uh, by about 10 or 15 years before. And um, I'm very aware of this because of dementia and uh, where especially Alzheimer's disease striking uh, temporal lobe and, and uh, the, the hippocampus and the, and the medial temporal lobe because that's where the biological GPS system is. That's what this is all about. Identifying cells that are very sensitive to our position in space. Uh, it's an area that, for example, I told some of you this little story, but um, in London, England, um, one of the tests that they give prospective uh, people uh, trying to get a license is to say, uh, well, uh, tell me how to get from A to B, and you know, there's several miles in between, and just march me through the streets as you go along. I can't do that at night or the lake. <laughs> um, but, but guess what? Somebody had the bright idea. Oh, let's do um, let's do functional MRI studies on a few of these people. And guess where the brain lit up? In the non-dominant uh, inferior surface of the temporal lobe. There's an area not much larger than my thumb here that has a high concentration of these cells that somehow provide. Um, I know it's a bad analogy, but GPS-like information or a memory of it. And obviously a prime target in diseases that affect the temporal lobe. So um, anyway, uh, enjoy it, all right. And uh, so there was a, the, the award winners last year. And I, I think I already mentioned, here's the lock and key, here's the cancer cell, here's the circulating T cell here, there's a nice fit. If it were left at that, they'd be friends. But they're not left at that because there's another thing. Normally, the two blue ones would be hooked together and say, oh, yeah, you can pass, you've got to pass. But if you develop, I mean, this is a cartoon, right? If you develop an antibody to block either or both of those receptors, then the cancer cell is seen as foreign. Then it was that. So it's kind of a kind of a nice cartoon. Uh, in fact, I think that's from the Nobel Academy. And this is very dramatic. So I mean, it's interesting what people do these days. One way is to uh, develop cells to, uh, using the patient's own cells. Now, this is from last year, Nobel and uh, take their T cells out, roll them in a Petri dish so you get an awful lot of them, and uh, order, actually before you multiply them, uh, insert using CRISPR uh, uh, a stretch of DNA that uh, would code for a particular antibody that you want, okay? And then, and, uh, and then you grow a whole bunch of these cells and then you infuse them back into the subject several weeks later, and it goes to work. Uh, it, it, it almost works too well. 
because sometimes patients get really ill because it's a massive attack on on their on the cancer cells. So, so uh, in the initial studies, people didn't know what to think, but anyway, it could be quite dramatic. So that's that's that. Now here are three fellows uh, for today: uh, William Caleb, uh, Peter Ratcliffe, and Greg uh, Samantha. Um, it's very interesting. But when I first looked at this, um, at this, what I thought, oh no, this is a very I know nothing about. And um, and and uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, but uh, but it, it's come together, or at least you you be the judge. But one thing I want to point out here is that often Nobel winners, there's a preceding award or two two or three years before, they're kind of prejudged. And, and the uh, Lasker Prizes are a very high profile prize. And the three of them together won the prize in 2016. If you compare the Nobel, uh, the description of the award and the summary from the Nobel Institute and, and the Lasker Prize, they look the same. In fact, I think it's better written for the Lasker Prize. And uh, so, um, and there it is in their own language for their discovery of the pathway that cells use to adapt to changes in oxygen availability. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, gee, that's a pretty uh, uh, common thing. Well, let, let's just put, put something on this because here's, here's what the Lasker Prize I don't want, don't want you to get tied up in all of this. We're going to explain all this. There, there are a bunch of molecules involved that mediate this, this hypoxic response or response to hypoxia. But that cartoon is actually better than, than the Nobel cartoons. So we're actually going to come back to this one. They, they, they actually did a better job. Now maybe they should reverse it. Um, so, uh, well, oxygen. Uh, most of us have been, uh, maybe not, uh, if not up mountains, uh, we climb. I'm a pilot. And the cruising altitude for my, on turbocharged aircraft, was somewhere between uh, 8,000 feet and say 12,000 feet. About 12,000 and a half feet, I have to legally um, have oxygen. And my passengers, all of them, have oxygen all of the time. And the engine performance falls off. And see, the, this is the airspeed. Here, this is the airspeed here. And look what happens when I get up to uh, four, 6,000 feet here. And this is full throttle. And, uh, and the aircraft is actually uh, uh, really delivering probably 65% uh, of its power or less. And it falls off. Why? because of diminishing uh, partial pressure of oxygen as you climb. Same effect climbing mountains, right? Except that it, 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 when I thought about this, this is very helpful for me. This is a very real experience. Of course, if, if, if you're uh, in, uh, in one of my flight examinations uh, for the commercial license, they, uh, they, the examiner said, well, you're at uh, on Mexico City, and uh, you're taking off at uh, at uh, 1 p.m. and this is the load that you're taking. And uh, and uh, should you take how much gas can you afford to take? And the implication being that I might just run off the runway before I got off the ground <coughs> because of the rarefied air at uh, at, at 10,000 feet. And uh, so it was quite a legitimate question. It's a very practical one. Uh, so, um, so oxygen deprivation. Uh, well, it happens with exercise. Uh, anyone who's been a runner or a skier uh, certainly has, has uh, experienced this, and uh, especially if they're you know, climbing anywhere. My son gets into this all the time because he's a mountain biker. And, um, but how does a cell sense 
oxygen deprivation. How does, how does that actually work? Uh, now, there are receptors we have in our necks, chemoreceptors, that do tell the brain that the oxygen level is down and that they need to breathe deeper and maybe more frequently. Okay. But it wasn't really, uh, and then there are other tissues like uh, the fetus and the placenta uh, that are very sensitive to oxygen levels. They need some signaling. And um, so the, the body of evidence I'm going to be talking about here is in the 1990s. 1990s and maybe into the first five years after. Now that doesn't mean that stuff hasn't gone on since, but the important stuff happened in that 15 years. And um, uh, so let's let's just move on here. And uh, so when I switch back, structure's great. Ah, well, this just shows you the PO2. Now here's a, um, what is it? Bucanada or whatever this place is. It's high up. It's at uh, 5,000, or yes, um, 5,000 kilometers. No, five kilometers, five kilometers. So that makes sense, that's about what, three miles? Three mile at altitude here. And look at what the PO2 is. There's 150 here, and it's down to say 80 or 90. So it's dropped a lot. This has brought up an interesting question because people go on mountain holidays, skiers, that kind of thing, but uh, some people live there permanently. And what happens to them? Well, uh, it, it turns out well, in fact, I'll, I'll quote this directly because a um, hundred years ago, the physiologist that Joseph Barcroft stated, and we can see this right here, all dwellers at high altitude are persons of impaired physical and mental powers. <laughs> <laughs> and later psychological studies, a whole bevy of them, including some quite recent ones, bear that out. So they're not working on full thrusters at that level. And even if they come down to the sea level, if they've been up there long enough, there's permanent damage. Now we know this in pilots, if they're doing a lot of flying and, uh, and, uh, and you know, the pilots always like to be above the weather, but being above the weather, uh, unless you've got a pressurized cabin, can be risky, particularly if you do it again and again and again and again. So, uh, so it is risky. Um, so that's the map, and uh, and then another friend of mine, uh, Bob Lee, a neurologist, he was ahead of me by a couple of years in Toronto, but he he was involved in a couple of the Mount Everest expeditions, and he got to the base camp for the last peak. That never attempted with the last part. But he was the doc, but of monitoring these people. And uh, boy, uh, almost everyone developed pulmonary and cerebral edema at that altitude. My oldest brother, who died uh, two years ago, was a pilot in World War II and flew supplies from what is now Miramar into China. That's crossing the Himalayas. No pressure cabin. So they're flying between the mountains in appalling weather. And they weren't shot down by the Japanese. They were killed off by the weather and icing, but also hypoxic. And it's insidious. So how do you know? And uh, but this is an interesting one. The intestinal epithelial cells are normally hypoxic, meaning that the, the cells that line our normal guts are hypoxic to some degree all of the time. If you think about it, they're the first, furthest away from any source of oxygen. They're at the end of the line, right? And this is worse in the case of inflammatory bowel disease. Biopsies of it show a loss of these uh, proteins that are, or changes in these proteins that are associated with hypoxia, which we're going to get into. So what we're really talking about today is the molecular basis of hypoxia. And one last, 
in the clinical side becomes a neurologist. But here are the, here are the changes in a, an ischemic stroke. Uh, so these are CT studies and uh, uh, cerebral blood flow, um, cerebral blood volume and blood flow. And, uh, and this is the, the ischemic African brain. This would have been an occlusion probably of the middle cerebral artery, a big one at the base of the brain. And, uh, and uh, so this whole, maybe two thirds of this whole hemisphere is at threat. In fact, probably 50 to 20% of it is dead already. And then give it intravenous, uh, 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 give it a, a, a lytic drug break up the clot, um, it wasn't long after. Now, this, there's a window of time that you have to work at this, and, and uh, it was around three hours. Now it's been moved out to about six hours. And look at this, the restoration of blood volume, but, uh, but especially blood flow in here. But look, it's not complete. Look at the area in here. It never did recover. And that's what I'm saying. It, 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 whenever you're managing somebody with an, an ischemic stroke or a heart attack, you're dealing with two things. Tissue that's dead, which you can't do anything about, and tissue at risk. So anything you do is for the tissue at risk. The dead is dead. You just don't want that to extend itself. That's why time is burning that little acronym or phrase that people use. So. So, um, on we go. Now, just a, I have to say something about here because I'm not going to assume that you know anything about genetics here, but you do need to know something about this to go further. I mean, they did get it for some serious work. First thing is we uh, humans have about uh, 25,000, depends on who's writing the article, 25,000 uh, protein encoding genes. We have many more genes but we have 25,000 protein encoding genes. They seem to make, I don't know where people come up with numbers like this, but 100,000 different proteins. Every protein has a certain, has, some of them have several jobs. Uh, some of them are singular, uh, but they all have structural jobs. Some of them act as enzymes, etc. but whatever. But one of the important things, um, we used to say that uh, you are your genes. Well, you're not. And uh, I just got this book yesterday. Uh, Jane back there will be appreciative of this, but the epigenetics revolution. Because um, it's a great book, great read. English author. Uh, and um, anyway, the point is whether, whether, when, when the embryo is fertilized, you've got one cell, right? And then it doubles, double, double, double. So it's exponential growth. Along the way to maturity, those cells change their shape and their job and what they look like. And why is that? Well, it used to be not so long ago that people thought that, oh no, here's a chair right there. We just take that stuff off. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you used to think, well, the cell is offloads that baggage. Well, it doesn't offload the baggage. All of the baggage is there. All of the all of the genes are there. It's that some genes are turned on, and some are turned off in an exquisitely orchestrated sequence of events. And, and that's how cells differentiate themselves. That's why they were able to take a fibroblast and back to its stem cell origin and then reprogram it forward again into whatever cell they wanted. You couldn't do that if the whole, uh, if all the genes weren't still present. But different ones are active. That's a really important concept to get. And, um, and they're aided in that by these transcription factors. There are other genes that have roles, uh, uh, key roles in, in turning on and off other genes. And their job may not be to make a protein, but their job is to say, okay, 
you're on stage now, you're on stage out, you are off, you're off. Okay, that's what they're doing. And those are, they're, they're proteins they make are called transcription factors. Okay, now I'm getting a little heavy here, but stay with me. What I'm talking about here is ancient stuff. We're right back to the origins of eukaryotes, complex single cells, probably earlier than that. We're talking two billion years of biological history, maybe more. These genes have been conserved over that long period of time. Why? Because they work. Nature kind of figured it out in a system, and they've kept, see, they, they, they've kept the same team in the oxygen sensing part. So these are the genes I'm talking about now, the proteins are, historically speaking, they've been around a long, long time because they work. And uh, now, just a word on mutations. Mutations have all, all, happen all of the time. I've often used the analogy that uh, if you had a, a Bible and you pat, passed it past a bunch of monks, uh, uh, how often would they make a mistake in transcription? A lot. In fact, sometimes it's created theological interpretive problems. And, uh, and so, uh, so, a lot of the, these errors happen and, and, uh, and uh, most of them are neutral. There, there, there's no cost to them. If you take identical twins and compare their, their DNA, they're not actually identical. And every time cells multiply in the body, their neighbors or uh, the, the primary cells, there's a chance of them making a mistake. And so the older you get, the more diverse in a way the genome becomes in different cell populations because you were born with them and then they keep this creative destruction analogy again. Uh, red blood cells last about three weeks. White blood cells, not a lot longer. Skin cells, you know, a few weeks. So we are constantly, re you are not the person you were born. You for sure are not. <laughs> Your brain cells may be mostly that, but you won't have as many. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, uh, so, but sometimes nature kind of makes mis a misstep at a disaster, and usually the disasters uh, are disasters, and that's the end of that mutation. But, uh, but sometimes not. So let's that's that's our deep dive into um, now. Just simple stuff. I'm advertising the Khan Academy here because, and there, and, and there are several of these that are freely available online. They're great. The profs who put this stuff together, uh, you recognize a good teacher because they understand the stuff. Uh, it's been estimated that you have to know at least five or 10 times your audience to make a clear share understanding or something. And uh, I don't know where they, again, come up with a number like that. But anyway, there's the double strand. They kind of pull it out, separate them, and make an RNA copy off one of those strands, right? And uh, so now you have a transcript, an RNA transcript of that. And, and in groups of three of these, uh, of these, ba of these bases define that would be one amino acid, that would be another amino acid, another amino acid. So you now see how the protein might be built up over into hundreds of amino acids, right? So that's it in, in a nutshell. But whether or not, uh, and, and of course, this is a protein encoding gene. It's making a polypeptide. It's making the proteins down here. That's another word for protein down there. Okay? So let's go along. Now the all, next two or three, don't get uh, uh, too upset with the number of players. These are all cartoons, certainly doesn't look like this in nature. But, but in order to make a copy, you obviously need an enzyme. And the enzyme is RNA polymerase, right? Its job is to make uh, kind of a copy of the, of the DNA, at least the one strand of the DNA. 
then these transcription factors that kind of say, okay, you can go now, or, oh, stop it. And, uh, and there's a promoter thing that kind of tells the polymerase to start at site C uh, here, not A, but not E. It tells, so it tells it where to start copy. And also there's another one, that tells it when to stop, start and stop. Uh, so it, it's no surprise it's, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. After all, we're pretty sophisticated. So I gotta skip some of the stuff, but just to point out here, just looking at four, at, uh, at four proteins here, uh, or four genes, here's one gene that's really been transcribed, it's actor. This one's completely silent, this one almost silent, and this one is kind of half silent. Multiply that times a hundred or thousands, and you begin to get the picture of what's going on. So, on we go. Now, I haven't marched through this. I don't know, that's the problem of sitting in the back row. Um, because this is why they got the Nobel Prize, okay? So, there are uh, uh, two uh, key proteins. If, if you ever hear the word protein, think gene, the key, the heat, trans created the protein, right? So there's a gene behind it. So there are two of these of these proteins, only two that are that are really important. HIF and this one DHL. And where do they get those silly names from? Well DHL because it was because it was found uh, in von Hippel Lindau disease, which we'll talk about later. So they get these funny names. So follow this through. In a normal oxygen but this HIF here, just think of it as HIF, HIF. A lot of it is made, it's constantly turning over. You don't want it around under normal conditions because if it's active, it turns on all kinds of nasty genes down here to do other things it might not want, like blood vessel proliferation and a tumor, okay? So it's constantly being made, but the way the normal system works is sure, the factory's cranking out HIF, or uh, HIF uh, here, but, uh, but it's destroyed down here. And so that's what's happened here in a sequence. It gets hydroxylated here, it's in the presence of oxygen here, then it hooks up with this buddy, partner, DHL, the von Hippel Lindau protein. It forms a complex, then it's targeted for death by these tiny little proteins, ubiquitous, that kind of attach to it and say, that, that guy's going down. And that's exactly what happens. It's eaten up in, in the cell. And the constant process going on, right? That's the, that's the normal environment. Now, we skip over here. Here's HIP on its own, uh, very low oxygen, relatively speaking. And uh, it doesn't get hydroxylated because that process, that enzyme, is oxygen dependent, right? So we get a whole bunch of HIF piling up here. And it's not destroyed, it goes into the nucleus. And where it begins its mischief of transcribing a whole bunch of genes that do things that you may not want. So that, I don't know whether, we'll come back, but, but you are looking at the slide from the Lasker Prize, you're looking at the Nobel slide, that's it. Um, so, go back here. Um, now, this is just kind of a summary here. There are three, three of these players, Semenza, the jet geneticist at Johns Hopkins, and Radcliffe, the fellow in England, a nephrologist, oddly enough, at Oxford University, and they were working on this stuff, and they were the ones that uh, found out what HIF was, what the HIF protein looked like, and how it was structured. They defined its molecular 
position. And, um, and the point that they made is that the tick is active in virtually all mammalian cells and conserved even in primitive species. So I made that point earlier. These are ancient proteins and ancient genes that made them and that have been conserved. And um, so these are summaries. I, I kind of like the quotes right from the Nobel thing because then you get an idea of what they were thinking or saying. The body's tissues can be deprived of oxygen during exercise or when blood flow is interrupted, such as a stroke, which is why I showed you that slide. The cell's ability to sense oxygen is also crucial for the developing fetus and placenta and tumor growth. And they discovered the molecular processes that these cells go through in response to oxygen levels. So you all have heard that. And uh, Semenza and Ratcliffe uh, in the UK worked out uh, what that process was with another gene and another protein, uh, which is secreted by the kidney and which makes more red blood cells and, uh, and, and more blood vessels. Uh, which may not be a desirable thing, so we call it good that. I think I get this one down. No, so there we are. Oh, no, I'm feeding myself. Back we go. Okay, I keep doing this. Um, this by the way, when I was a trainee, I saw my first case of foster holding dog disease, and it wasn't pretty because this is a genetically transmitted disease. If you get one copy of the abnormal gene, that, uh, that uh, uh, EHFL uh, gene, then what happens is that, uh, is that, is that it's, it's, uh, it, the term among geneticists is it upregulates the gene that encourages more blood vessel formation. Of course, I didn't know anything about genetics at the time, but what I did see is a, uh, is a kid in the teenage years, I looked in his eye, an enormous vascular tumor in his, in his eye, and uh, although we didn't have MRIs at, uh, at the time, we had other ways of detecting uh, lesions, and they were in the brain stem, they were usually in the brain stem or the cerebellum, that's the cerebellum. There's one in the brainstem. Not, not a good place to have something. That's really tricky for a surgeon to get at uh, without causing a disaster. And, and a couple of them actually in the spinal column. That, that, that's, that's really common. So it's a nasty disease. I looked up, I was given the job of looking up the, as residents are, uh, all the cases that have been in Toronto and I wanted, could come up with was five. Then I went to the library and I looked up the Beijing Medical Review. And uh, so this had been back in the uh, 1970s. It reported over 400 cases. And, uh, and they weren't making it up. And, and the medical papers were interspersed uh, uh, with Mao's poems. <laughs> uh, it's quite an interesting thing. Uh, so, uh, so we, we, we've come a long way here. Let's just keep going. And uh, where am I going here? Well, I just said that, so. Oh, one of the important things that it does, it's not all bad when these, when this, uh, uh, when this system kind of kicks in and hypoxia, because it has sur survival mechanisms. Healthy, normal cells have a very efficient system for generating energy. High energy phosphate, ATP. Some of you may have heard of it, but it's a very efficient system, but it only operates in the presence of oxygen. What happens in this situation is that if, if the body senses hypoxia for, for some reason, then it switches to a, to a metabolic pathway that isn't nearly as efficient, but doesn't need oxygen. So it's making less ATP to kind of keep the cells ticking, but ticking slowly, okay? This is what kicks in in runners when they get to the 
mile 18 and the marathon and the cramps and all that kind of thing happening. They, 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 that aerobic pathway has long since uh, dispensed its available ATP. And, that, that, uh, and now we're breaking down fat and, uh, and, and we're dependent on this kind of low energy yield system, but it doesn't depend on oxygen. So, so that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, uh, tumors take advantage of that, especially solid tumors. Because as you might imagine, a solid tumor like this, or you know, somebody has a big solid tumor in the frontal lobe or somewhere else in the body, you can well imagine that the blood supply at the core isn't what it is at the periphery. So it's kind of running on less gas. So to survive, the, those inner parts of the, of, of the cancer kind of switch to this low, and relatively low energy pathway to generate the, the, um, the energy to just stay alive. And, um, and sometimes, I don't know whether the next slide is a good example of it or not. Oh, yeah, I didn't. You, never mind all the boxes. Remember I said there's one, there's two important proteins, there's one. Look at all the systems it affects. The pulmonary system, breathing, metabolism, development of blood vessels, pulmonary circulation, uh, uh, red blood cell production, lung, uh, cancer. So that's why they got the Nobel Prize. That this is kind of a neat little system with only a few genes and a few proteins, and yet it seems to be key to so many other things going on in the body. And, um, and, uh, and here's an example of one of the things that happens in people at high altitude, living at high altitude. This is a pulmonary arterial, a small artery. And, uh, and look what happens. The wall kind of thickens. Fibrotic tissue here narrows. And anywhere you see a narrow blood vessel, that translates as deprived blood supply, but hypertension. So this is an example of um, hypertension, alveolar hypertension. Okay, so, and, and in the tissue, this could be the core of, uh, of uh, brain tissue here, in these areas that some areas simply can't get enough oxygen and, and they die, they become necrotic. Other areas of the tumor are hypoxic and have this very high level of the protein if that we're talking about here. And other areas are kind of relatively good. But look at all the areas where when this system goes wrong in some way or another, uh, I mean, we're talking prostate CA, uterine CA, ovarian CA, CA breast CA, <coughs> you name it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so, one of the things here are what, <coughs> what, what's the payoff here? Can you develop drugs that might actually uh, have an effect and take advantage of the system? And, uh, and that's in fact what's happening now. And if you, I don't know whether you looked at the Nobel Award itself, um, but they certainly highlighted the potential of using some of these, blocking some of these drugs or blocking the genes um, to, uh, to help patients with different types of cancer. So far, I haven't seen anything. Uh, the most important part of this, I think this whole peeling in particular, oh, here we are. Colleagues hail the trio as role models to other scientists. They are extremely humble people. All three hold scientific rigor and reproducibility to the absolute highest standard. You don't often see that out in public. That tells you that these three people are really respected by their colleagues. And uh, an interesting quote from Caleb here, particularly his take this field to task, that's just before he got the Nobel Prize, so you take it a chance, right? Take this field to task for pursuing possible cancer treatments that aren't backed up by strong evidence. The most dangerous result in science is the one you were hoping for because you declare victory and get lazy. 
underline the NIH in the United States had big, big healthcare organizations. And think about Alzheimer's disease these days, which completely has lost its weight over the last 10 or 15 years because of this group think. And uh, so the point's well taken, and, uh, and in an essay to Nature, he says, uh, the main question when reviewing a paper should be whether its conclusions are likely to be correct, not whether it would be important if it were true. Boy, that's a, that's a life lesson. Never mind a, a lesson in science. Uh, real advances are built of bricks, not straw meaning the solidity of the evidence. That's why they said up here um, about uh, all the rigor, scientific rigor. That's what he's talking about, I think. So, uh, and there they are. Um, so I, I um, you know, I didn't know much about this, anything about it actually, when I started out, and I thought, Joel, somebody else would be doing it, but that didn't work out. So, I, it, it's actually been good because I, I didn't probably start out where you were, and um, and it's been fun. Um, and I I think the lessons are not just the stuff that they do; it's how they do it and the standards which which they keep. I think I think that's really important. And it's, and it's not often that colleagues come out in public and speak of their colleagues, and they're not associated with it, not in the same lab. And they might even be competitors. It's like that book I just saw on the New York Times Book Review about Margaret Thatcher. The third volume has just come out. And, um, and she, oddly enough, had a lot of friends among the labor, among labor, among people that you know, they couldn't agree on almost anything. But they could agree on how about, how about uh, respecting one another. And so I'm looking forward to kind of reading that. Um, interesting. So, any questions? I know it was all simple. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was, yes? How far is there research to be a practical application for possibly curing cancers. Uh, we, the dozens of you mean this cases, this yeah. stuff? Yeah. Um, uh, Ten or fifteen years, but sometimes things can happen on a dime, like like really quickly. But there's an interesting thing in this book. Uh, science has changed a bit. And one of the things that alarmed me. This book. I knew it was happening over the CRISPR thing because I've gone three years. We've gone three years. I kept announcing every year I think Nobel's going to go to, to, to CRISPR groups. But of course, they were suing each other. And, um, and um, uh, and, and so she, where was it now? This, it's, it, um, yeah. Follow the money. Follow the money. Uh, there's another source of information. Or if if all we read is the scientific literature, then the narrative for this story is quite inspiring and fairly straightforward. But there's another source of information, and that's the patent landscape. Mm -hmm. Institutions and individuals, especially institutions. <coughs> want to control the market. So if, in other words, if a, if a drug is developed, they're, they're going to get a piece of the action. That really slows down the field. And it also creates a nastiness uh, in the climate of it because you don't want to tell anyone. You don't want to, you don't want to share your stuff because somebody will scoop you for millions or billions. And so we have the unseemly thing in the United States of uh, essentially MIT, and to a lesser extent Harvard, suing and Stanford suing each other, as well as the, the individuals themselves. And um, it, it shouldn't be.
But it's, if it's relatively new in science, it's because it's big now, and you mentioned cancer, uh, cancers uh, and it can be transformative. But, uh, but if people work this way about this, or, uh, and try to hoard it, and keep it to themselves, and uh, don't share or charge a heavy price, it's gonna cost a lot more. Most of these, uh, like, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Huntington's disease, now, no, we're over time. Huntington's disease is caused by an autosomal um, transmitting uh, dominant gene, right? You get one copy, you're getting the disease. No one knows what that protein does. They know what the gene is, they can specify that, but they don't know what the protein does. What they do know, do know is there's a lot of damage. And they developed a really clever way of going around that. So they they were quite aware that CRISPR was struggling a bit, off-target mistakes, various other things, and the need of their ethics, that kind of thing. So they said, well, look, um, the highway between the DNA and, and the protein is messenger RNA. It carries the message from the nucleus, the DNA and the nucleus, to the ribosome and the cytoplasm where the protein is made. So if the manufacturing plant is in the cytoplasm and the head office is in the nucleus, then why not intercept the traffic between the two? And that's exactly what they've done. They've developed, developed uh, drugs that uh, in one way or another uh, hobble that messenger RNA or corrupt it in some way. So the, and, and it seems to be working in Huntington's Korea. And, the other one, I, you know, um, in my youth of pediatric neurology, I, I saw uh, at, at sickies in, in Toronto, tragedy after tragedy of, of kids with, uh, and at the New England Medical Center, with progressive muscular atrophy, which is a death sentence. And if they, if they some of them developed a little bit later, of course, a little slower, but the results the same. That's been the solution. Uh, in that disease, and so kids that couldn't swallow, kids that, uh, that were having trouble chewing, kids that couldn't sit up, uh, kids who couldn't walk, the disease stopped. But more importantly, it actually started to get better. Now, it's not gonna fix everything because a lot was wrong before they started the treatment. So, and that was using attacking the RNA. So there's a lot of innovation out there, but you know, it's a, uh, the rough cost, $100,000 per, I mean, all of this was gratis from the companies because they wanted to show that it worked. So if you get in early, it'll be free. But can you imagine that uh, on much more, in much more common diseases and where you've proven that it works and, um, and then what? I mean, there isn't enough money in the, in, in the province or the or healthcare to begin to pay for stuff like that. And yet, uh, it brings up the argument, how do you uh, put, put a price tag on, on a life? Or mm -hmm. you know, it's a really, really tricky thing because the counter argument is one that the UK has gone through and some European countries, and they say, well, why is the bank bust? because we've got so, all these old people around. So we're not gonna treat certain things beyond a certain age, so no transplants beyond uh, you know, 70 plus, and uh, no access to IVIG beyond a certain age. And uh, on the math, they're right, uh, because the benefits aren't as striking, although I would argue about the IVIG. But, uh, but that's the kind of thinking that goes on, versus the mother, whose children have a mitochondrial disorder, which is a, really a disaster. And that was fixed with, uh, with three sources, right? Uh, the mother's uh, nucleus, uh, a donor, female, whose nucleus was taken out, but she had normal mitochondria, and then the father to pregnant. So, uh, but it works, and I've seen a, enough of these <coughs> problems to realize, gee, it's a, it's a really nasty thing. 
So um, how do you put a price tag on it and stuff like that? Doesn't seem to appear at this level. I think this is fairly low budget research. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yes. Two observations. Here. You want to talk about the periodic table? Sorry, sir. You want to talk about the periodic table? No, I don't. No. <laughs> I use that on my mouse pad, by the way. Okay. Um, one of the mysteries is those that have been overlooked for the Nobel Prize or ignored in the Nobel Prize. Hawking comes to mind. Yes. But also the um, crystallographer whose work was the foundation of the DNA analysis. Yeah. I can't think of a name right now. But without her, there would be no DNA discovery. Well, yeah, that was the X-ray diffraction yes. technique, and and uh, it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it's always claimed that, uh, yeah. that 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 Watson looked over his shoulder, yes. or had a privileged look. As a, well, in fact, they already wait when you see this. By the way, I didn't uh, copy it, but those ten things. Oh, here, here it is. We'll, we'll maybe get this copied out for you because they're, they're little gems of review articles. They're, they're one page, it's like, like, like uh, nature is like. So this is the first uh, exoplanet. But there's a, a very good one of exactly what you're talking about. So, yeah. so it would be a good thing to maybe we could ask the library to make some copies of this. Because it's, it's, it's very good. Um, now I've lost the thread, as people of my age do. Overlooked. Oh, oh, overlook. You know how I put right at the top of the list? Henrietta Lovett. Henrietta Lovett, I think I mentioned to you, I think the first talk here, she's the Harvard woman who did a lot of the astronomical studies and showed, uh, well, she wasn't the first one to show variable stars, but what she showed was the frequency of the variability was related to the luminosity, the brightness of the star. And then she put two and two together with somebody else uh, who had a distance reference for it. And for the first time, they knew uh, how to, uh, well, that's what led to Hubble's discovery of other galaxies. The paper was, her paper was published under the name of her boss and no, no mention of her name. And uh, she was living with her mother, and uh, her health wasn't good. And uh, she's a, an amazing woman. It is, her work was very creative. It wasn't just, she wasn't just stamping stuff out. She was doing really interesting stuff under challenging conditions, and certainly bosses that were anything but helpful. Uh, in fact, the guy sold the, the credit. Um, I think it probably happened to more than more than a few women along the way, and still happens. Interestingly enough, on that respect, nature and science. Those two journals have, uh, in the last two years, I've noticed they they've uh, one one of them. I think it's Nature has a female editor, and if you look at on the staff, there are more and more women, and it's become an issue. Okay. So, and they they talk about, but um, I won't say too late. Never too late, but but still, uh, because I had a colleague in London, uh, who I name now retired. She was incredibly good, but she was one female in 24 males. It wasn't. I, when I think back on it, I don't think I don't think anyone was deliberately. I don't think they were kind of scheming against her, but but she did have a hard time, and and it was only when she hit her stride, and then. She was insecure. She latched on to a uh, another colleague who was very good, but he was much better on his feet uh, than actually doing the science. And she provided the science. Well, of course, everyone thought it was him doing the science. And then, late, just toward the last ten years of her career, everyone kind of realized, "Wow, this person's really been doing a lot of good stuff." And she got a lot of do, but uh, I think that's a common, that's a common thing, very common. And, uh, and I was there, so maybe I was part of the wrong system. I don't know. Anything else? No. Okay. 
So you've understood everything. <laughs> so you know, so ne ne next next next, <laughs> next week is uh, uh, the David Elkin has the Peace Prize mm -hmm. and uh, the, the Literature Prize, and um, so I think it's worthwhile this year to have it every week. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. yeah. rather than every month because you kind of forget about it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do that. But there, are, you know, there are a lot of other things. I wouldn't mind doing a series on or working with other people to do a series and not necessarily target the, the Nobel laureates, but people with extraordinary histories, like Krebs of the Krebs cycle. Krebs is a very interesting guy. I, I mentioned just the gene kind of because uh, there's a whole cycle named after the Krebs cycle. And it's a, one of the fundamentals. You go into any chemistry, biochemistry lab, and there's one of these big Krebs cycle things on the wall. And uh, but the idea for that, he had been struggling to figure it out. And then um, he uh, went to sleep one night, and as the story went, he woke up, and he had the aha moment. Got it. But instead of getting up and writing it down, he went back to bed, and that morning, he, he, knew, he knew something had happened, <laughs> but not that. And then, and then, uh, and then a few weeks later, Alan Lightman tells his story well in the book that I passed on to Dave. But he, he, um, he or, yeah, he was, this time, he had another dream. It came back, this time he stayed up and, and uh, wrote it out. Yeah, it's a, so I think there's a lot of stuff like that that's really interesting and, uh, and some people have more of a struggle than others uh, doing this stuff, but, uh, and the mix of politics and science. You know, uh, Churchill was, I think, if I'm not wrong, I don't think I am, was the first British Prime Minister to actually give a, a place in the cabinet to a leading scientist and talk to them throughout the war. Uh, yeah, I don't think there is one. Yeah. A Canadian cabinet, decent cabinet. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> you're just basing that on odds. <laughs> okay, right. okay. So we'll wrap it up. But listen, uh, if you if you have a look at this, and maybe we could get the library to make a copy. Of it. I, I mentioned you this before, but it's very good. It takes those ten articles, and, look, uh, and I've only got a few. Let me first exercise it. The cell identity one, which I think is far and away the most important one, meaning the one back going backwards and forward. Programming and um, one of the things you learn about uh, some of these scientists is how incredibly uh, hard working they are. I mean, um, um, Hodgson and Huxley were, were my poster. I mean, there was a period in neuroscience I call it the Camelot period, and the, and the kind of post war, immediate post war period going up to maybe 1980. And one Nobel Prize after another was awarded to somebody from the UK. One Sweden one time, and you know, anyone else was, but it came from a nucleus of London, England, Cambridge, and Oxford. And Hodgkin and Huxley had no money. No one had any money after the war. They built all their own apparatus, their own oscilloscopes, and stimulators, and everything else. And of course, the damn thing didn't work. They knew what they wanted to accomplish because they figured out in their head, between the two of them, before the war, what they wanted to do. But of course, they didn't have the tools to do it. Then after the war, they, uh, they, they went back at it. No grants, no one ever had a grant in those days. It was all homemade stuff. And of course, failure after failure, because it was like a chain reaction. If one link went, then the whole, or the whole experiment went. So they were working on a giant squid axon, one big enough that you could actually see the, the, the nerve fiber, and therefore change its interior and record from the inside. So it was a beautiful experiment. And months went by, these guys, at a Cambridge lab. And then one night, everything worked. They knew exactly what they wanted to collect. They 
kept that damn thing going for 36 hours or more. Bing, 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 bing. And, uh, and they collected all the evidence they needed for the three papers that they needed for subsequent, uh, subsequently led to the Nobel Prize. All very carefully done. And, uh, but it shows you the impatience because many people would give up earlier. And I think uh, these guys were maybe that stuff too, to stick at it. And uh, so it's not all about braininess. It's also about uh, determination and, and willingness to really pitch in. And uh, I don't think the lazy ones get, get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. <coughs> All right, so uh, next week, um, <coughs> next week we hear about peace prize and why we don't have peace. <laughs> David, are you ready for that one? <laughs> why we don't have peace. <laughs>